Hello and welcome to The Last Standy, a board game podcast coming to you from several thrilling countries across Europe. I'm joined here today by Alessio. Hello, everyone. Everyone. Cara? From Germany. Hello. And uh, fresh off, the, well, on the dock or off the boat, <laughs> it's, it's David. Hey, yeah, it's me again. Moin Moin from Germany. <laughs> and I am your host, Fen. Uh, today we're going to be talking about three absolute Fen. Uh, today we're going to be talking about three absolute titans of the board gaming hobby with Sleeping Gods from Ryan Lockett. Laukat? Lockett. Lockett Laukat. Ryan has a great surname and I always forget how to pronounce it. A feast to Odin from Uwe Rosenberg and Concordia from Odin from Uwe Rosenberg and Concordia from Mac Gurditz. Uh, but before we get into that, it is time for the last standy catch up, and we'll begin with the uh, member who's been on walkabout. So, how things have been with you, David? I spoke that like Yoda. How have things been with you, David? Oh, uh, that like Yoda. How have things been with you, David? Oh, uh, pr- pretty fine most of the time. Like uh, I'm doing a lot of further education to get like a better job in the future. And a lot of learning at the moment, like some t- some days I'm learning like 12 hours per day. That's a lot of stuff that needs to go into my head till I have my, go into my head till I have my final exams in uh, May. So yeah, th- it's going all, fi- all right so far. And Kara, how about you? Um, well, I have basically left the more or less and I have resumed board game evening operations um, got around to play tapestry last week which I've been looking forward for to for a while um, I'm not sure what I expected but it was different um, different okay <laughs> it's, um, I, I, I think all in all, I expected more. Um, it actually, at first glance, it seemed like it's just so much, and I don't know, and I will never get it. But in the end, it felt so much, and I don't know, and I will never get it. But in the end, it felt surprisingly Ka- shallow. Kara, I agree with you, but it's a kind of good game. In the end, you, you, you just go in expecting a civilization game, you find uh, quite a kind of civilization game, you find uh, quite a kind of civilization game where the game ends for someone else at some point in the game, and then uh, after two or three plays you end up liking it. Yeah, I mean, I, I was the one that had like three turns to go when everyone else was finished, so that was fun. Um, and the whole yeah. the, the developing technology is completely out of order is 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 somewhat funny like i had a warship before i had language i think but um yeah priorities <laughs> game of x-wing last week yeah you won it yeah i saw on discord congratulations <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah so that's that's great um I just wanted to say in regards to Tapestry, I kind of love technology games where you can do the technology out of order, especially something as fundamental as themselves piloting a ship when they can't speak. <laughs> do they use whistles and clicks? But that's language. So do you have some kind of hive mind group of people who are just like born natural fish sailors? I don't know, but it's, when, it's weird. <laughs> when you have a real connection with people, you, you just need the... Uh... Knows what they have to do. That's the secret. Yeah. No communication required. That sounds more like, you know, oh, it's, they just know they have a connection. That sounds like the love boat. <laughs> part of the crew, part of the ship. What about you, Alessio? Oh, uh, a lot of things. I, I am actually wondering how I'm uh, timestamping the podcast. So I think I can safely say I did not yet receive uh, um, Tainted Grail. This is uh, because I will never receive it, actually. And uh, uh, I had uh, my in-laws with COVID, so I most uh, of the latest two weeks. I have uh, new interns at work, so it's more work for me for a while. 
but interns are the future and who else will bring us coffee otherwise and uh, that aside i am happily playing actual game uh, and i have a couple of new games but i want tell which games are because we will probably talk about a few of them uh, in the future episodes and that will time will timestamp the podcast so i will keep the maximum secrecy about those keep the maximum secrecy about those what about you fan well you know things just continue i've been playing a lot of dinosaur island rare and right I think that's how it's pronounced. You make yeah. an emphasis on the rar, like capitalize it. You make yeah. an emphasis on the rar, like capitalize it. Um, by the time this podcast comes out, there will be a written review of it on Board Game Geek. Uh, it's kind of a lot of fun. It manages that line between cartographers, which we talked about enjoying so much in the previous episode, where you draw stuff on, where you draw stuff on a grid graph paper, which I like. And also a bit of a points building engine as well, where you do stuff and you get the bonuses that trigger and pile up. And finally, you can have the joy of recruiting a PR representative, PR specialist, and then, oh, has consumed my PR representative. Oh, that's a shame. That's a real (laughs) shame. Uh, That's like, it's such fun to sit there and play and watch things go wrong in your own park and other people's. It's really enjoyable. And it's got a nice, you can have player friction if you want, but it it's not mandatory. So it, everyone's parks get more dangerous or not. So great. Uh, I also played Tales from the Loop, which I'm, I'm going to write about. And the review might be out by the time this podcast episode goes out. I don't know. Time is fickle and circular. Um, but it's we did the circle and circular. Um, but we did the yes. <laughs> yeah, but the quick version right now is it's a really good game. It's nicely put together. It's got some lovely cooperative story elements. The mechanics are solid as heck, but the actual stories you go through leave a little bit to be desired. The actual stories you go through leave a little bit to be desired. Uh, there's plenty of space for them to just put plug in new stories. Uh, they're cool. They're interesting. Tales from the Loop is kind of that very nebulous sort of thing, being based on effectively just a bunch of paintings, fantastic paintings. So it's like a soft recommend for that game. Um, I definitely, if they get a bit better at stories, the story section, the kids on bikes part is just fantastic. You have you have a limited amount of time to go out and do stuff, and you've got to get home in time uh, for dinner. Otherwise, your parents are going to get upset with you, and they might. I think mechanically, I prefer it over the Snallygaster situation, but um, and thematically, I prefer it. Snallygaster situation is very American, but there is something fun about how the Snallygaster situation has a better endless in quotation mode where you can just kind of run a new thing in an interesting manner so that's the two games i've mostly been playing apart from the ones we're going to be talking about now i just finished a game of concordia sorry i'm oh, late oh, my uh, no it's fine oh, oh I hey. Hey. so uh, wonderfully audrey you're just in time uh what have you been up to nothing you're just in time uh what have you been up to nothing Nothing? That's a good thing to do. Chill <laughs> and, uh, out. Still in the job search. Uh, things have been really hectic for the last few weeks. So I'm really hoping it pays out uh, soon. Uh, except that, yeah, video games, a bit of painting, but... Uh, except that, yeah, video games, a bit of painting, but... Uh, yeah, see, yeah, there is something in the board game front, but uh, it's more... Uh, not a playing, but a purchase uh, planning. Uh, I sold, uh, a husband and I sold a few games that we knew we weren't going to make. Uh, Santorini, Five Minute Dungeon, and For the Queen. Which are kind of good games. Um, yes and no. Um, <laughs> for, for various reasons, uh, like Five Minute Dungeon is really not something that we'd invite. Uh, for uh, an evening where it could 
be a good game for. Uh, for the Queen, we're more interested in a game that gives us the story and we interact in the story than we create it from scratch. Uh, Santorini, well, I mean, uh, we can play a game of more, play a game of more, pion, yeah. <laughs> by not really. Yeah. <laughs> and I, 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 it's not really something that I think needs to have such a big box and components. Uh, and clank, uh, not not my thing. Anyway, so we yeah. have 60 euros in vouchers at the board game store, and anyway, so we yeah. have 60 euros in vouchers at the board game store, and we are like, so what do we get? And after a bit of thinking, husband said, oh, okay, let's pick terraforming bus, which is for one slightly cheaper than the vouchers that we have so we would have picked some uh, eons and uh, uh, eons and uh, expansions or mini expansions to, to, to complete but terraforming mouse is out of stock at the store so he said ah spirit island spirit island is out of stock at the store yes. <laughs> anyway, you are leaning towards complex games now. Yeah, yeah. Very, very heavy. Yeah, um, yeah. We still have to decide which Lacerda to get because uh, we will get one at some point. Uh, but we really need the theme to be something that we like, and no, none of us really. Oh, yeah. At some point, we might get on Mars and say, "Ooh, yeah, heavy," and cry in a corner, maybe. On Mars, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> uh, on Mars is on my list of things to do. Uh, Still, and it's been a year. And I said that to. Uh, Still, and it's been a year. And I said that to <laughs> the game to pick, we could get the Lord of the Rings uh, one with the app, maybe. Um, That's pretty good. Yeah, I'm. I'm not. Sure. If if we wanted a narrative game, I would be looking for something like. Uh, How Tented Grey plays? I'd be looking for something like uh, How Tented Grey plays. Uh, oh, you thought hmm. about Tented Grey? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I know. I'm still waiting for my shipping too, but I'm not sure uh, <laughs> what exists already, which would really exactly fit that. Uh, the, um, uh, above and below, near and far, etc., etc., which. Would be close, but I would want something well, where it's uh, um, more, less uh, or more. I'm trying to find the right words, but where there is a story and not snippets of adventure. First. When it is available yeah. in French. Yes. Because that's yeah, also a criteria. Yes. Yeah. Mm, yeah, there's a lot of words to to um, to go through if you have to do it all in English. Yeah, sure. but, but, but wanna... the game we're going to talk about had its kicked out of a French uh, version, uh, I think, last autumn. It didn't participate, but I'm waiting for uh, the shop time. Yeah, that sounds great. So you just reminded me of one other thing that happened. I got the Nordic, Nordic edition of the Terraforming Mars big box. Um, and first of all, it's a nice box. Um, and first of all, it's a nice box. It, it sticks all the expansions in. That's great. But secondly, the Nordic edition is the English edition with a Nordic sticker stuck on the back on the shrink wrap. It's just the English edition back on the shrink wrap. It's just the English edition. I was expecting to get the bonus cards in um all the nordic language languages and like pick which one is going to keep nope nope it's just english secondly i can't recommend it because it's lacking like it's got so many empty so get consider getting the small box if you want the terraforming mars um plastic pieces the big box is you're really paying for a lot of space uh, that it doesn't look like you're going to get the add-ons for short of on the secondary market uh, st so. stupid question then why did you get the nordic edition then well because they don't I have, have the english edition <laughs> no they do but the english edition is out of stock and i don't have a problem getting something that has text in swedish okay. my micro macros in swedish 
Um, so that's and some of my railroad links are in Swedish. I it doesn't make a difference to me. I can read Swedish pretty well. Oh, okay. I just struggle to speak it. Just struggle to speak it. Uh, so yeah. Anyway, we have uh, been uh, chewing the fat for quite a while, so I think it's best that we weigh the anchor, stoke the boiler, and get off sailing the mysterious islands of sleeping gods with Kara and David. So, take it away, guys. Okay, so it's the year 19... Take it away, guys. Okay, so it's the year 1929, and Captain Sophie Odessa just left uh, the port of Hong Kong on her way back back to damn it, I forgot where they were going New York nowhere New York New York nowhere yeah to New York and um, she has a crew of very intriguing different characters uh, on her ship and she's uh, following the um, call of her um, estranged father who's uh, who's on but something happens they just three days after leaving port they uh, are caught in the worst storm they ever encountered and once um, whatever the weather clears up they have no idea where they are they are not anywhere on any map um, called wandering sea a mystical place um, inhabited by a wide variety of cultures and monsters um, like an archipelago is that the right word it's of... the right word it's archipelago but archipelago. it's not a, it took me years to learn herbally i had a lot of uh, trouble learning how to pronounce as well <laughs> Ar Ar archipelago is the same in italian too Archipel. okay <laughs> so uh, lots of different islands and they learn that in this world there are gods who are sleeping and whose they might be awakened could send the crew home to their known world. So all they have to do is collect uh, eight totems to awaken these gods and as thanks be sent home to earth. That's the and um, that's more or less the only fixed part of the story because the game is huge you have as uh, in near and far your atlas book but in near and far you basically picked one double page as your game mat uh, for the whole book so if you leave a page uh, to the side it shows you where you have to go next so you flip to the appropriate page that comes next to this page and um, it creates a really huge map um, where you travel around, you have different locations you visit, um, interact with the uh, people who you encounter there and so on. So it's really a, an open game, an open world game. Um, you start with two small quests that give you a hint on where you might go first um but apart from that you can just you can on where you might go first um but apart from that you can just you can go anywhere and talk to anyone or explore anything um and you only have this very vague mission of acquiring totems to wake up the gods acquiring totems to wake up the gods and um, what the story in the end is, is up to you. Yeah, um, it's a huge game. I already said that, um, not just like regarding content, also regarding table space. There's really a lot going on. You have Captain Odessa as a character and eight crew members who you control. If you play with multiple people, you divide these eight crew members up between you and everyone. Uh, takes shared control of the captain and um, the game is played in turns 54 and each turn consists of three steps first you do a ship action so you have a shipboard where the manticore captain odessa's ship is pictured with different locations like the deck and the sick bay and the quarters where you can pick one of these actions so you have to pick a different one than in the turn before. different one than in the turn before um, you do that you get command tokens you can use to do different actions um, 
you reset command, you get ability cards and so on. Then the second step is the event deck and that's what determines how much time you have left. Step is the event deck and that's what determines how much time you have left. The event deck consists of 18 cards um, <clears throat> and um, you flip a card, you do the event, uh, you might, it might be you encounter some traders on your travel with whom you can trade or encounter some traders on your travel with whom you can trade or whom you might drop. Um, so there are sometimes choices you can do and um, you might encounter a storm and have to succeed in a challenge or your ship takes damage, um, stuff like that. And finally, the action driver travel, where you can move around the ship on the, on the map, you can explore a location, you can visit a market uh, to trade or you, to buy new equipment, um, or you can visit a port to uh, repair the ship or heal crew members and, or also um, spend experience points crew. And um, pick two of those actions and then the turn is over. Apart from that, at any time you can use these command tokens so you can acquire in the ship action to activate different abilities of your crew or um, of items you've collected. For example, the best item ever, Bigfoot the dog. Um, you know, Such just... a good dog. Yeah. Well, it's, I, it's... I, I'm <laughs> off to get that every time. <laughs> Every time without fail, that's like my start is why are you sailing around if you without a, be, a, a best boy or girl if you could get one? Dog, and it's not a good dog. Good question. Yeah, uh, I know it's a good question, that's why I'm asking it. The werewolf series, werewolf the apocalypse, and all that, there's some bad dogs in there. True, true. <laughs> First time I heard this, like this whole concept of an open world board puzzled me because one important part for me in an open world game is that my actions, my decisions have an influence on the world. But like a board game is a pretty static thing. Um, so you can't just, you know, we have our storybook and you can't, um, but it's all done with the quest cards. So every time you get a quest card um, first of all it gives you it gives you some story and some hint for example oh yeah you heard this rumor about this person who might be of help to you uh, somewhere in the east so you know okay from my position right now if i travel east there a person that might be helpful and uh, the quest card has a keyword and if you read uh, story entries in the storybook sometimes or quite often they ask for certain keywords so it's like okay you are here do you have this keyword? If so, read this paragraph. If you don't have it, read the other paragraph. So, if so, read this paragraph. If you don't have it, read the other paragraph. So, if you might encounter the same person, but if you haven't heard they might be helpful, you won't get information from them. But if you knew beforehand, oh yeah, they might be helpful, they actually can give you the information because you ask for the information. As if they actually can give you the information because you ask for the information as a stupid example <clears throat> and it works really well it's um it really feels like i'm in this world and what i do matters and things are changing like there is a village that's under attack and through this and i visit the village again different things happen which is, is great that's as it should be and um yeah um it's feels a little overwhelming the first time you start playing because it's like, okay, um, now I'm here, I've set it up, but the two starting quests give you some guidance and it just, you know, develops from there. Yeah, I, I want to say about this that actually uh, the first 18 turns were actually about knowing about the game and I felt pr pretty underwhelmed by the game, whelmed by the game s so far because uh, uh, you were just moving from place to place. You o always had a tight economy of actions, uh, and uh, y 
it looked like uh, you were just waiting for stuff, trying to get a totem. I, I, I think I got two just waiting for stuff, trying to get a totem. I, I, I think I got two by the time the event deck cycled uh, for the first time. And uh, after you cycle the event deck for the first time, the, the game changes completely. It gets a direction, you, you get, uh, it gets a direction, you, you get, uh, you get involved in the story, a lot of stuff changes, happens, uh, depending on where you are, stuff happens. Uh, it's really a perfect engine about the sandbox ways of this game. It's about uh, Sleeping Gods is like all those small stories it tells, like you have like this, this locations you can explore and then you will read through the storybook and follow like clues you can like, or keywords. But there's also like this um, small things like if you do a certain thing, a crew member might get their uh, point of view or they dislike it. And that's very like thematic in general because it like combines the storytelling aspect with the game mechanic. <clears throat> And that's also pretty much true for like uh, systems like the combat system, which is pretty smart because like you draw a system, which is pretty smart because like you draw several cards that are like written down um, inside the adventure book and then you place them on a track in a certain order and like they have like this health grid, like some areas they, they are pretty much life points and some areas they have grid. Like some areas, they, they are pretty much life points and some areas they have like special abilities and yeah, things like that. And, but if you attack them or you can decide where to attack this grid and place your markers down there, like your damage markers. And I think that's, I think that's a pretty interesting thing to do because sometimes you might want to like fill up a part of the grip that actually has no benefit to you, but like the one connected to it might might have a benefit like okay if if i don't take out this part of the grid uh i might get up uh, similar which is pretty interesting but like in general this is like uh, a very interesting mechanic because like this grid system is rather unique i think it's the first time i've seen something like this and like some other characters like normal you have like um you have to put uh, down your damage. Certain characters, they allow to like place it like uh, diagonally, which is like uh, can help a lot with those uh, situations. Yeah, I, I'd call it reverse Undertale. <laughs> yeah, it's a very interesting um, combat mechanic. Um, it wasn't particularly interesting um, combat mechanic. Um, it wasn't particularly well received by the public, the playing public. Um, we now know in the sequel, Sleeping Gods Distant Skies, there's going to be an entirely new combat system, which I quite enjoyed the grid based system, and I hope that I quite enjoyed the grid based system, and I hope that remains in some fashion because, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, I think there is um, actually like yesterday or today I encountered. Oh, my cat wants pets! <laughs> 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 a uh, board game official alternative to the uh, combat system that simplifies it yeah because apparently a lot of people feel like they want to enjoy the story and they don't want to spend so much time with the combat and decide oh where do i put my marker and so uh, ryan um did like i think the card and you look what does it do and then it's defeated and you get like and so, um, yeah, um, but yeah, I also enjoy the combat system. I think it's great. I really like, um, also like this idea that what you're doing is like a slash. Um, that's the, the idea behind this, uh, you know, each other. Um, so if, uh, uh, I don't know what do I have here, Gregory with my, with the equipped ra rapier um, slashes, he can actually, not just attack one enemy, but not just attack one enemy, but put the slash over to the next enemy. Yeah, um, that's the way to it, the boss. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, it's really interesting. It's also great how you have spaces with. It's also great how you have spaces with nothing in them, uh, and if you're damaging them, you're not really hurting the the opponent, the creature. Um, but you might be filling them in because you need to get where, to where the wound spots are or to shut down their attacks, which is also a nice... With their wounds, you can neuter their weapons and reduce the amount of damage they're going to deal at the end of each combat round, which is pretty cool. Uh, I'm going to use that as a brief jumping point to recommend a board game uh, that does... A similar but not identical combat system, and that's a sand, semi-sandbox, sleeping gods style game, storybook. Uh, it, it's interesting in that you can you can import characters from role player to play, or you can play with pre-generated characters who just want to jump in. Instead of having a big overarching sandbox campaign, it's got a bunch of mini little sandbox. It's got a bunch of mini little sandbox adventures. Um, which feels like the chapters in Legacy of Dragon Halt. They all tie together to build a complete narrative, but you get an individual episode arc in each one. They use, based on their dice system, because it's role player with two L's, not an L and an E, um, two L's, not an L and an E, um, that you build di a dice pool by spending stamina and stuff, and you roll the dice, and you try and match things on either a skill box or on uh, a combatant's uh, dice and the bit that reminds me of uh, sleeping gods is the dice if you don't cover them will end up dealing damage. Sleeping gods is the dice if you don't cover them will end up dealing damage back to you or to the party so you've got again that desire to cover up the slots only here you have to cover all of the dice slots in order to nail the the, the results you don't get that interesting empty space that you salt you don't get that interesting empty space that you still want to fill in and the other one is uh, i read just recently that um ryan didn't wasn't aware of this video game when he started making sleeping gods but brenner did tell him about it and that is the P tell him about it and that is the pc series sunless sea and sunless skies which is sunless sea you're on a boat beneath ground in and then water London. World. You, there's a lot of mechanics for traveling here and there, uh, fuel, food, and so on and so forth. And then you get to various where there are permanent consequences. One I quite enjoy is you go to an island and the inhabitants are guinea pigs and rats and they're arguing with each other um, about, like, as a class war. And you end up being the catalyst who picks one side or the other to be in ascendance because, you know, that's what your character does. It holds. And it was interesting to learn um, that Ryan came up with this concept that in in you know is serendipitous, synchronous away, um, and that's like uh, I something something cool. I have to say which also follows my uh, late catch up. Uh, now catch up. Uh, now I'm regretting that when I was a kid I didn't know about the books choose your own adventure uh, books. And I, I think that's something I would have liked then, but I'm not sure that you there. I would enjoy the same since I've seen so many things that stemmed from many things that stemmed from that. Uh, so I, I'm a bit conflicted with them, but I love their heritage. Yeah, they do. They have a great heritage. Uh, you might want to look at Legacy of Dragonholt, which is a big campaign, choose your own adventure with multiple different endings. It's by Fantasy Flight. It goes in. It's by Fantasy Flight. It goes in and out of print. It's great. Or um, on PC, you can get the... Yeah, I think it's it, it's Fighting Fantasy um, Sorcery series, which is like an ongoing series of five books, I think it is, that tells a story. And it's got lots of five books, I think it is, that tells a story. And it's got lots of branching paths. And honestly... It's better to play on PC. It even gives you that option to do what all the kids used to do when you had a book. I had a well-thumbed copy of Robot Commando because dinosaurs, or Robot Cowboys wrangling dinosaurs was the concept. <laughs> wrangling dinosaurs was the concept. Um, and, and, and you would just kind of put, put your thumb in the book after a while because it kind of sucked to 
turn a page on a decision you've made without any information and the book went and you're dead which this <laughs> this doesn't do it role player doesn't do it uh legacy of dragon i think some text in english and reading it out loud in french is so so annoying uh, yeah yeah that's the problem with these these books the it, often done in English, translations can take years to come out, even if they don't. Yeah, which is why I initially passed uh, Sleeping Gods, and when the Kickstarter, right, it, it was, I wasn't uh, really confident in my money ability uh, by then, but yeah, yeah it, it should scratch my itch. Yeah, it, it should. It's really pretty as well. I love the Atlas pages, um, all the little details. Pages. Um, all the little details, uh, there's kind of hints as to what the places you're going to might be like. Um, and it's beautiful to look at, very wonderful. Um, and also, if you get the Dungeons expansion, there's a bunch of like separate Dungeons expansion. There's a bunch of like separate maps you wander through in like a little dungeon. And there's even an extra atlas that kind of plugs into... The main game to add a few more areas that you're allowed to visit with their own stories so it's all mm. yeah but sadly sleeping god should be available in stores in fran in french in august sorry uh might no. have to change depending on how things go and my vouchers aren't valid until august uh... oh dear well uh, yeah but, you, but you i'm sure by then i'll have a job and can pay for the game one would certainly <laughs> hope so yep um, so I and provide this criticism of the game in a very uh, spoiler-free manner, but I like the story, the overall arcing story of Sleeping Gods. I like it a lot. But this is a game that's trying to say, hey, you finish it, you can. They really missed a trick in telling the story here, and I hope that. Um, Distant Skies perhaps embraces this. So that's the vague part. Um, for those of you who don't want to hear spoilers, um, but rough spoilers, I'm going to hear spoilers, um, but rough spoilers, I'm going to just kind of go for it now because I've played through the game. I've seen almost all of the endings um, through multiple playthroughs. And I was very disappointed that the resetting of each campaign that the resetting of each campaign isn't because of a time loop which the whole setup feels like they've been dragged there and they're trapped and they can't get out until they solve this totems issue and what i was hoping for going through this was a gradual unlock of extra paths that would get you closer and closer final ending where hey you've unlocked all the small endings open up that package which says open once you've gotten all of these done and then it pops out one more quest and there's uh, a storyline that's been buried in the book that you haven't seen and it will just kind of unfold and boom that's where the sleeping gods would be you like nothing yeah so instead you kind of just reset back and try it again and have a new journey through that and that is really enjoyable but i, I genuinely feel like being looped back to the beginning would make the endings where you don't close everything out and get a satisfying conclusion feel free. Um, instead, all the unlocks are extra bonuses. Yeah, that's also like... <laughs> when I played the game, I had so much fun. It was so great. And then I got to the ending and it was great. And, I, and you have this achievement list where you scratch out and I and you have this achievement list where you scratch up which totems you collected of the i don't know 60 or so totems someone surely has counted them i think um, 100 in total okay and you got a catch them all and the uh, okay and you got a catch them all and the uh, 13 endings, so you scratch all of this off and then you, you count how many you have in total. So totems plus endings and you unlock stuff. And I was really excited because I thought, oh cool, I get new quest cards because they are quest cards you unlock. I was really excited because I thought, oh cool, I get new quest cards because they are quest cards you unlock. 
and I thought, great, so for the next playthrough, I start with different quests that lead me in a different direction. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The sound of disappointment. I, I had... <laughs> the sound of disappointment. I, I had exactly the same disappointment. Yep. I looked at that sheet and I was like, cool, achievements, unlocks. This looks like it may have some resettable legacy elements. I can't wait for my starting quest to now include this extra like keyword that I go somewhere and different. Even if it's not like a full thing, it would lead to some harder to find totems or unusual things. And then gradually the game unfolds until you've done it all. And yeah, no, no, I was opened, I picked up the first one and read it and was like, <laughs> This is not what I hoped it would be, especially based on where you get the dog. Yeah, there's a hint. And I was like, that's super cool. I, I'm so looking forward to that turning out to be the thing and however it goes, because Groundhog Day is amazing. And yeah, yeah. so that's that's my disappointment. But that the, the actual story itself, like the endings are written. And they are satisfying and enjoyable. And the story's great along the way. So it's a minor niggle, I guess. Yeah, I like, think, like if you play the game multiple times, you, you have a, a very important decision to make. Yeah. You have to decide, do you want to carry over information? Yeah. You have to decide, do you want to carry over information from the previous playthroughs? You can play each game like with a clean slate, uh, you pick a new uh, game sheet uh, with a new clean map where you have, haven't have any notes on it and play again. Or you can on it and play again. Or you can keep your old maps where you note it down, where you re need which keyword, where you found totems, etc. And use this information to basically avoid things you have encountered before. Because the problem, again, I have the same two starting quests, which lead me at, to the same locations, which give me the same follow-up quests, which lead me to the same next locations. And technically, I already know the location of eight totems, which I need to win. So where is the incentive to do something else? And um, so, hey, I will avoid these specific locations. And um, like after three or four turns, I'm on a completely different path because I just checked out different locations. I got different quests, which I'm following now. And um, it's also great, you know, if you find a quest and you look at your old sheet and it's at this place where I needed this keyword. Um, so I don't have to go around looking for it, but I know exactly where I have to go. So that's also nice. It's yeah, that's the decision you have to make. And I personally recommend use the information you got from previous playthroughs. Yeah. Making making notes is pretty much. That's yeah. how we did with the other game that I've already mentioned, and yeah, we, when you have keywords and especially when you have three or four keywords, yeah, okay, that's easy. But when you start to pile keywords over keywords, you have to need to have something to track it. Well, anyway, the map is pretty cool about that. You can notate. True that you should avoid the stuff from your previous uh, playthrough. But I have to say, uh, my first playthrough, I went west and north. Uh, if you just decide to go south at one point, you you just uh, go into a wholly different. I played, uh, I played basically two completely different stories uh, just by deciding to go in another direction, even if I started the the playthrough basically the same. So I'm um, sorry I need to leave you behind. I enjoyed to sleeping out part, yeah, but I absolutely. need to return to my lectures. Um, well, good luck with yeah, those. Good luck. Yeah, thanks a lot. See you yes. soon. Next time. See ya. Bye, Bye, David. Bye. And I think that's a good point to kind of just put a button in it because we've been talking for a while about this. We could do an episode talking fully on Sleeping Gods nonstop. Not do an episode talking fully on Sleeping Gods nonstop. Not before uh, I have my French version and at least one playthrough. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> we can revisit the game certainly when you have thoughts on it. That would be interesting. Yes. For sure. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, also, so, yeah, just one thing that mm -hmm. I would want to know. 
Okay. Uh, also, so... th yeah, just one thing mm -hmm. that I would want to note as well, uh, which is not uh, uncommon with uh, this editor, is the absence or crazy absence of Kickstarter exclusive stuff. Yeah, for the most part, the any exclusives tend to be very... Or ...exclusives, more than Kickstarter exclusives, if I remember correctly. But that means with my French version, I won't be missing out on major stuff. Probably just minor things here and there. Which is good! Yeah, uh, yeah I, I, I just add that uh, the time to get by, but it's not like it's limited. So, uh, anyway, yeah. the French version is for now just the core box, I think. Yep. Yeah, yeah well that is the triumphant story-based juggernaut that is Sleeping Gods. And we're going to move on now to another one, but we're sticking with sea. This time it's based on historical seafaring, and we can get engaged in food, glorious food, with a feast for Odin. So this is a 2016 Uwe Rosenberg worker placement game, and um, um, it's probably my third favourite Uwe game. Um, it's probably my third favourite Uwe game. Um, Bonanza's top. Nusford is second, and this is third ahead of Caverna. It's, well, there's a lot. So if you just sit down to a game of A Feast for Odin, and you've never played before, game of A Feast for Odin, and you've never played before, it is overwhelming. This game is an excess. And as such, I'm not going to be able to jump into fine, tight detail about every single tiny little thing that happens. Because this is a worker placement game with 61 actions in the base of the Norwegian's expansion. So it's overwhelming. And the nice thing is it's pretty easy to explain to players. They look at this little board and there's these ton of tiny steps. And they're like, oh my goodness, this is so much going on. There's so many things. And it's great to go, hey, don't worry about it. Most of this is just reminders on things you need to upkeep and gain and break the down the more you like. Well, this is where you trade and trading lets you make your goods better. This is where you get livestock. This is where you go hunting. This is where you build various ships, whaling ships, exploring ships, pillaging ships, 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 ships. This is where you go pillaging. This is where you go whaling and so on and so forth. Uh, and you can craft and it's just... Just pick something. Pick something and go for it. And the game is lovely in that it just hands out uh, points and you can meander your way through to a decent score while learning the strategy in the game, which is sweet. So what actually is A Feast for Odin? Uh, well, actually is A Feast for Odin? Uh, well, at the heart of it is a polyomino horde collecting arrangement game. You have on your personal board a large square hoard with a ton of negative points on it. And you're going to get things and you're going to put them in the hoard. To... You're going to get things and you're going to put them in the hoard to cover up the spaces. Some of the spaces, if you surround them, you get a bonus every time on the bonus round. But you don't have to cover those up if you don't want to. You don't have to leave them open either. There's also a ton of minus point sections and there's this clever little income track which runs diagonally through the whole thing income track which runs diagonally through the whole thing and the rules for the income track is you can't cover up a number unless you've covered everything below and to the left of it so you have to kind of branch from your bottom left corner and spread out uh, by putting in goods and gradually this will fill up your hoard what's rather fill up your hoard what's rather neat as well is the hoard has rules you can't put green stuff next to green stuff uh, it doesn't like to hang out, but you can put blues next to everything because it's it's gorgeous and wonderful. And you could put coins anywhere. You can't put food or livestock into your hoard. I mean, that food or livestock into your hoard. I mean, that's not the Viking Feng Shui way at all. So no, no, no. Um, and that fills up this thing. It's it's literally like being uh, Carl Urban's character in Thor Ragnarok, this is my stuff. Thor Ragnarok, this is my stuff. Um, and that's such an engaging, fun thing, because not only do you have a bunch of different shaped goods that you're, you're getting your ho a hold of and maybe trading to get better goods and upgrade them, or perhaps you're going pillaging and you're coming back with an oddly shaped 
you're going to smith a cross to fit in. All the varied shapes just work. All the varied shapes just work incredibly well to put together this interesting thing. On top of that, if you want to store more stuff, because hoard, 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 apparently you can take it with you, you can buy houses, which allow rules. You can even go colonize an island and then cover it with your stuff as well for more points and more bonuses. This is, there's so much. There's, there's so many, very many different little things you can do, uh, you know, and it can feel it is so big, but there's also some various occupation cards. You get dealt some at the start that can give you some focus. Also, every Uber game I've played in recent times, which has animals that you can collect the animals breed, which is a nice little mechanic. If you get two animals of the same type, it's sheep and cows in the core game. And if you get the Norwegians, there's pigs and horses core game. And if you get the Norwegians, there's pigs and horses. And if you have two of them, then one of them becomes pregnant at the end of a round. And then if you have a pregnant one, then the next time you get an additional one. Right, so you, you can get early sheep and cows and just they will sit there and breed and get bigger and bigger. And they score points. Or if you're really urgent, they score points. Or if you're really urgent, you can interact with the most important punishing mechanic of the game. And that is the feast. So every round you have a worker track and workers pop off it. And gradually this little track gets longer and longer and during the feast phase you need to fill this track with yellow or adjacent to each other but you can rotate them so there's this fun little puzzle of i need to get enough food to feed my vikings and i also need to get enough stuff to stick in the various points in places and just it all meshes together in a thoroughly enjoyable fashion after it fly by and they've done some good work in avoiding too much punishment for somebody already taking an action. There's options to duplicate someone's previous action. Also, the better the action itself, the more workers you put on it. And this is something I really like from the Century series, is where you have multiple workers, couple workers can go on to certain jobs to, that are better or to make them better. So it is a wonderful game. Now, uh, Alessio, have you played it? Yeah, actually, I played it. I, I, I would like to share my impressions, actually. <laughs> so, uh, I played it on Board Game Arena. <laughs> so, uh, I played it on Board Game Arena because I don't have the boxed game. I have to say that uh, I completely agree with you when you are overwhelmed by the game. I, I, <laughs> I, I the fool, decided to... Well, it's board game arena. I kind of it's board game arena. I kind of watched the review, so I'm I think I'm ready to play this game solo. And I started the game. Everything wasn't allowed. I I was kind of okay. I have to read the rule book. I have to watch the videos. Uh, up, it's a great game. I think that as a Uwe Rosenberg game, this is my second favorite. The first being patchwork, and actually the, the the special puzzle part of this game is what I like most. Uh, the worker placement game is uh, is you want to just give up optimization. I I, I really found it hard to plan ahead uh, more than a couple of moves, so that's basically it. That's basically it, but the systems are solid, they are two mini games. It's like uh, playing Agricola uh, patchwork, and that's kind of fun. Uh, this is uh, the cool part of the game. I still do not understand, and probably I would if I see the deck, uh, the occupation cards. It seems that they, I, I can't count uh, properly from them. So, but this is probably because I, I don't have the boxed game, so I can't see the cards, their number, and I can plan according to those. Yeah, yeah. It's a bit of a statement and a triumph that the occupation cards are so ancillary to having a good fun time. Get them down by playing the big actions and so you get free occupations drawn or played. Uh, but also you can just, nah, just ignore them or just play them for the victory points they're worth. Uh, it is a very Uwe thing to have these decks of occupations and like here's deck A, here's deck B, here's deck C. Um, <laughs> 
in this field has itch, you know. Oh, okay. So, so they they are they are actually multiple decks like Agricola or, or Aleftau, yeah. right? Yeah, there are. Yeah, yeah. It recommends you start with the A deck, um, and there's also a starting occupations deck for each pile. Uh, yeah. So, it's, okay. It, you get an occupation to begin with, and you get some weapons and tools randomly. You go. Yeah, uh, th- that makes more sense actually. Yes. <laughs> anyway, as Two sub games uh, playing together. This is spectacularly made because it's actually you play Agricola to play Patchwork, and it works. In the end, the special puzzle is 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 what I want. Play Patchwork, and it works. In the end, the special puzzle is 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 what I want to play. It's want uh, 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 it's what I want, and uh, playing the worker placement to get stuff. It's actually rewarding in this case. Yeah, everything about this game is it's a generous rewarding in this case. Yeah, everything about this game is it's a generous experience. It's what I like about Nusford and Halatau as well. Is this is, these are Uve designs where you get given more and more, so you do stuff and more stuff comes back, and you don't have this horrible crushing experience. Enough food, so have a giant pile of negative points. And tough luck, you weren't fast enough to get to family planning, so now you don't have enough workers compared to everyone else. I, I really like the worker placement mechanic of unlocking extra workers just through time. Not speeding stuff up for other people, just through time. I have to say that a game that I would uh, enjoy now because yeah i thought about narrative game but the, the other alternative is worker placement uh a bit uh let's say on the heavy side and one thing that's for sure is uh, in video games i like civilization games because i like to build because i like to build stuff and to do stuff with it and it would seem that that uh let's say passion of mine would be served here yeah, you, you also build a, a bit of an engine. That's actually that's actually cool. Yeah. I like engine building. Actually cool. Yeah. I like engine building. Yeah, yeah. You can use your occupation cards one of the biggest things that turn into engines, so you, you'll sometimes get occupation cards that say you when you do this you get a bonus and then you can tag that together with other occupation cards. And the game's very generous at giving very generous at giving you more occupation cards to decide which ones you actually want to play. So yeah, you've got that engine building. Uh, also, the I haven't even really talked about it in detail, but the pillaging mechanic is quite nice. Um, it, hunt mechanic uses the same thing as well, but when you go pillaging, you need a boat, and then you roll a d high as possible, because that'll give you the number of points you can spend to purchase loot from the from the thing and you get three rolls and each time it's your choice do you stick with that one or do you try it again um and if you fail you can spend spears or swords or some of the other card resources to an acceptable level hunting is the opposite you roll the dice and you want to score low it and also sometimes you roll a d8 on the weaker actions so it's got a little bit of that that output randomness you're not quite sure but if you mess up you have ways to ensure that you might get something, or if you do really badly and you fail, that you might get something, or if you do really badly and you fail, or you choose to fail, you can option choose to fail, you get compensation. Sometimes a worker back, sometimes some cards and wood and stuff. So, yeah, it's a, it's a very generous and giving system that says to you, go on, explore. Giving system that says to you, go on, explore. Do these things you're going to get stuff back from doing this stuff and have a fun time ranging all of your stuff in the most pleasing pattern you can possibly manage. Yeah, yeah. I also have a player interaction with uh, Uwe Rosenberg Games. So this is uh, a game you you can just uh, leave on the table or in this case playing tarts on Board Game Arena and uh, it is still completely playable even if you go there if you get there uh, one day or uh, the, the next day or a week uh, later because it's just uh, it's just there the, the it's pretty immediate to read and that's cool because uh, that's uh, that's a thing i want in a game which is basically a solo together 
yeah, it is a solo together. It has a nice, clean, simple solo mode as well. You just use two different coloured sets of workers and you leave the previous coloured set on the board to block the actions you use. So you can't just use the same action every turn. You can only use it every other turn. Um, Nusford uses the same system of double workers. It's it's great. A box sometimes same system of double workers. It's it's great. A box sometimes can be heavy and frustrating, and I wouldn't like a, playing against a bot that just randomly blocks actions in this game. So, uh, yeah, it's it's a really good solo game. It's I would say in higher player counts, it can get very long if. I would say in higher player counts, it can get very long if you've got somebody who isn't good at just doing the simultaneous action section, but it's a it's a treat. We really do need to get on to our final topic, though, because we don't have a huge amount of time. So uh, we're going to stick in the past with a game that you can fully do with Concordia. Okay, so I have to to teach this game in under five no minutes. No pressure. <laughs> I read the comments when I was talking about... Uh, the um, uh, Oink game stuff that I didn't manage to get it all done within the time limit, so now you've got one. So, five yeah, minutes, okay. are you ready? Free? Okay. okay, Concordia is basically an an economy game, an economy game, I would say, where it counts your area presence because there's a map where, where you basically are a patrician family of Rome, of ancient Rome, and you are trying to expand your influence but you are trying to expand your influence by uh, through commerce so concordia is the name it means peace through agreement and uh, that's actually what the game is you build uh, uh, your economy by building colonies which uh, make you get resources and this resource economy by building colonies which uh, make you get resources and these resources are used either to sell for money and with money you get cards and uh, you can get more call you, you get more settlers to get more colonies and go on but but let's get to the rules you basically start uh, 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 this game is completely cost customizable it depends on the number of players and number of expansions you have in uh, the base game you have either the italy map for lower player counts and the imperium map for and i have all names in latin so i'll probably mispronounce or misname uh, something when i play anyway <laughs> you start from rome and uh, you have one settler on foot and one settler on uh, sea and you can use them to travel and this resourcing with commerce and uh, stuff building new colonies and so on uh, how do you do that with uh, one of the two most important aspects of the game which is the deck building you start with a full deck of cards in your hand and this deck is all the actions you can have a full deck of cards in your hand and this deck is all the actions you can have at start you have all the same number of cards and you ne you never draw from deck because the deck is completely in your hand and uh, uh, you have one card which is the tribunus i hope that and uh, uh, you have one card which is the tribunus i hope that's the same in all languages <laughs> and uh, this card allows you to reshuffle all cards you already played so it's uh, the the first part of the game is basically uh, your hand management be because uh, you have this deck you can buy new cards and you can uh, uh, do that with money money you get from selling resource resources and you can decide to buy cards by playing a card which is called senator but uh, in the first thirds you won't have enough money or enough resources to get the market so it's uh, a matter of deciding if you want to waste your actions and just use the tribunus to have a chance to uh, throw out your production cards which are the prefectus in, uh, for, in subsequent turns or if very last card so that uh, you basically use your deck to the fullest but of course you will have a diminishing selection the more you go in the game and this is the first 
layer of depth of this game which is already extremely cool because there are entire deck building games uh, made only of this aspect. The other aspect is the uh, area presence because the map is div divided in provinces and in these provinces there are cities and in cities you can build colonies. Uh, the first one getting to a colony uh, can build the colony for the, the settlement for the cheapest and uh, the, the next players going on are playing progressively more until you get to three colonies uh, uh, on, the, on the same city and that's uh, the city is full and you can't get uh, there anymore. Every city uh, added to a kind of resource which you get when you uh, activate a Prefectus card in that province. The cool part about this is when you activate a province with a Prefectus card, you actually, uh, everyone who has colonies in that uh, gets the resources associated with their colonies. But if the, when the province is, you, you can activate only active provinces, uh, when you activate the Prefectus, you also get the special resource from that province. So that is that province. So that is the second uh, extremely cool part of the game, which is the player interaction in which you decide, okay, I, I, really, I really need that wine, but I, I don't want uh, the other players to get their bricks or tools. Uh, or textiles, you don't want uh, the other players to get their bricks or tools uh, or textiles. Uh, actually, the, ca the game is perfectly balanced to make every decision important, both with player interaction, because actually you can decide interaction, because actually you can decide to get a colony in the way or to occupy a road with your settler so that uh, uh, your opponent cannot traverse that route uh, this turn and uh, must have must five minutes okay Aww. anyway i'm done I am done. I am done. Yeah. Uh, well, I, yeah. It's we were a little short on time, so we do we can spend like ten minutes or so talking about the game. But I very briefly want to. That being said, walk never through. challenge an Italian person to speed chatting. Yeah, I know. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> I, I didn't have notes for this. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, the the general rule, the general way I do this is I sit down, I lay it out, and I go, "This is," and you do what the card says. Let's go. And that's, yeah. that's, that's it. That's everything else I teach along the way. Sometimes if people are a bit concerned, I will walk through each of the starting uh, cards that people have in their hand. Uh, but that's it. It's right up there as one of the fastest teachers I ever have. There as one of the fastest teachers I ever have. So, yeah. Yeah, I think that uh, this is the only, the only one game where I can teach it completely while I set up the game. It's um, it's such a fun game that I own. It's such a fun game that I own Concordia. I have the edition with the where the, this there's this ongoing thing with the woman on the front of Concordia where she keeps being changed. Um, <laughs> the very first version of her, she's just staring vacantly into the void. Some crisis of faith. Uh, you know, serious ennui. Um, then there's another. They so they redid it because a lot of people made fun of the face. And then the new face that came along, the one I have, she looks like um, one of the others from the Mandela catalog. She doesn't look human at all. She's <laughs> at least a bit weird. And then in the Concordia uh, app, which I have the digital edition, they've they've redone her face to make her more welcoming and friendly. Uh, because she's also the face of the tutorial. So. No, she she's spooky. She's spooky. She's completely the, spooky. No, I think she's more friendly now. She's like a friend and uh, let you play it a few times before she devours your soul, which is you know, yeah. it's nice of her. Yeah, um, ac actually, my, my my copy is more friendly because she's she's looking down. Oh, that's that's the Mandela one. That is that's horrifying. If you stare at that face, like the the, the guy she, she's trading with, stare at that face. Like the the, the guy she, she's trading with, he always looks human, but she very gradually slides away from it into this strange void where 
you might catch in the corner of your eye and you're like, has her mouth turned into a gigantic black O and her eyes stretched out? Is And you look again and nope, no, nope, she's she's just there stretched out. Is And you look again and nope, no, nope, she's she's just there like not wanting to be involved in the scene at all. So, yeah. I don't yeah, really feel I, like I, I having well, my she sword involved. No, oh, no, I don't. <laughs> no, no. Um, I have Concordia, Concordia Venus, Concordia Salsa, Concordia Solitaria, and I... <laughs> Concordia is exceptional. <laughs> yes, it, it, Concordia is a phenomenally good deck management, hand, card management game. Um, with some great interaction and really fun like pieces of chicken where you're waiting for somebody to reset the board so you can get the goods you want and cards because these you can't have extra abilities that are a bit better and different compared to what I do normally. So I want that. Uh, it's a such such a fascinating and clever game. Although, and I always forget this, what is the trigger for the end of the game? Oh, the end of the ga- the trigger for the end of the game. End of the game is either you get all the cards from the market, you ex- you you get all of them, or you build all your all your houses. When you do, you get seven point bonus, and you trigger the last round of the game. There we go. That's like really clean and easy to track and keep an eye on. Fantastic. Look, no. that's like really clean and easy to track and keep an eye on. Fantastic. No cards left in uh, the in the pipe. Yeah, exactly. I'm going to just give a rec- firm, solid, big recommendation to Concordia Salsa. It has mechanics that just feel like they should be part of the main game. The, the salsa, the main game. The, the salsa, the salt. Um, not sauce, salt. Uh, it's... Is, uh, is, it is like a wild card resource. It's fantastic. And there are um, forum cards that give you unique abilities at the start of the game. And you can acquire them at points through the game, if I remember correctly. Uh, it's the allocate the types of resources each place generates randomly. This adds more. It's hard to get because it tends to sell out really quickly whenever it's available. I thoroughly recommend that. Um, you don't need Concordia, Venus and Concordia. You can get away with just one of them. Venus has rules for, ten, uh, for team play. So. They uh, actually two things. The first one is that the mini map expansions are act- are actually worth it because uh, changing map does a lot in this game. Changing routes, changing provinces, changing allocation of uh, cities is actually a a big thing in this game. Yeah, yeah. Uh, cities is actually a a big thing in this game. Yeah, yeah. The, it also helps having varied maps for different player sizes of numbers of players, because the main map that you originally start on is quite large and generous, and then on the back of it is a. It's better with a few less players, but it doesn't cover two to three. Of it is a. It's better with a few less players, but it doesn't cover two to three. So that's always really nice. In many ways, the, having the map choices reminds me of what I love about Power Grid, which is you buy a map. And it has a few like changed rules, and suddenly the game is like completely fresh and new, and things that you weren't keen on. The second thing about salsa is actually that uh, in ancient times, uh, Roman soldiers were paid with salt, and that's actually why you say the word salary now. Hmm. Yeah. Um, well, who knew that this many years later, the modern uh, version of the soldier, the game. I actually regarded this as the best game I never have a chance to play. Uh, the app made me uh, actually play the game a lot more because uh, basically I played this uh, uh, with college friends and uh, the app did a great job of giving you everything and fast enough. I think that... Uh, Right now, the Salsa expansion is available on the app. Uh, at least I received the, the advertisement for that, so I guess so. Yes, it is. It's available. I received the, the advertisement for that, so I guess so. Yes, it is. It's available on the app. So, definitely a recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> easy recommendation. All three of these are easy, easy recommendations, and they're quite different, but they are just huge punching heavyweights in their categories. Uh, Huge punching heavyweights in their categories. 
I mean, most of most of the time we do episodes about we talk about games that we like. We should do an episode about yeah. games we don't recommend. <laughs> Except oh, the Destinies. <laughs> What don't you recommend? I'm not talking about Red Rising ever. <laughs> Through the first game I played and the second game I played, and now it's on the Board Game Geek market for sale. But it's well beloved by a lot of other people. So, mm. but yeah, uh, what was I saying? Yeah, Feast for Odin is currently the 22nd highest rated board game on Board Game Geek. The number 17 is Strategy, and Concordia is at 19 over. Yeah, they are. They've like Concordia is a twenty thirteen game, and the design still holds up. And I haven't played a game that does what Concordia does. Yeah, actually, as an economy game, as an area presence game, and as a hand management game, hand management game, it has, uh, it combines uh, all of this. Uh, all of these aspects, uh, all of these mechanics, in a way, basically only Concordia does, and it does simply. It absolutely does. It really does. And it's got a nice amount of play. absolutely does. It really does. And it's got a nice amount of player friction um, for a game that is very much a Euro game, an economic kind of engine game. So that's pretty cool. Uh, it in many ways it reminds me of Power Grid, but it in many ways it reminds me of Power Grid, but just easier to get into and jump into and faster to play. Right. So I think that's it. Yeah, basically. Yeah. About Concordia, at least. Mm, yeah. So that's uh, that's three hard, firm recommend for that particular genre that they're in. And just a general recommendation of just about everyone should have Concordia, in my opinion. It's not that expensive, and it is just so good. So with that final dash in of salt slash salsa slash salary means we're out of time for this podcast. www.patreon.com forward slash The Last Standee, or follow us on The Last Standee on Twitter, or subscribe in your preferred podcast app. So it's farewell from Alessio. Goodbye. Audrey? Tumbleweeds? <laughs> bye bye! Tumbleweeds? <laughs> bye bye! Kara? There we go, Kara. Auf Wiederhören. And myself, and remember that the second E in Standee this time is for Embade. <laughs> economy. We've already done economy, but embed is something that happens to ships. We've already done economy, but embed is something that happens to ships. I'm sorry, but what the fuck does that word mean? (laughs) Uh, It's a nautical term. Yeah, so it is... uh, Well, there's one where it's formed into bays hollowed up by the sea, so a coastline can be embed where it's been turned in. But I was uh, particularly referencing the nautical version which I will get the exact definition back up from nautical terms. It's a condition in which a sailing vessel, um, especially one that sails poorly to towards the wind, windward, is confined between can't get out of the bay because it's in bay. Yeah. So it's a bit like embedded, but in a bay. Mm. Yes. Yes.